please welcome Roy Orbertson. Roy Orbison is a name that resonates throughout rock and roll history, evoking both the heights of celebration and the depths of personal misery. Join us as we take a closer look through this musical icon's intriguing life. From the peak of his chart-topping songs to the depths of his heartbreaking losses, here is the life and tragic ending of Roy Orbison. Early Life Roy Orbison's saga from a small town in Texas to his ascendance to become one of the greatest performers in music history is an intriguing story that highlights the confluence of perseverance, talent, and the pursuit of a dream. On April 23, 1936, the future superstar Roy Orbison was born in Vernon, Texas. He was the second son of Orby Lee Orbison and Nadine Vesta Schultz. The roots of the family can be traced to the Irish immigrant Thomas Oribison, who settled in Pennsylvania in the 18th century, giving a strong historical background to Roy's ancestry. The employment search consequently drove the family in 1942 to Fort Worth, upon which Roy attended Denver Avenue Elementary School. This was the time when his dad gave him a guitar on his sixth birthday, which was instrumental in his growing interest in music. By seven years of age, Roy was all in when it came to music and thanks to country legends like Lefty Frizzell and Hank Williams, he had his early shaping influences. In 1946, the family moved yet again this time to Texas, a small town where the population on oil fields and football was immense. Even within the unspoken canyon landscape, he found comfort in music, and because of it, he formed the Wink Westerners Band with friends from high school. Their performances at local bars and radio shows on Curb and Kermit demonstrated Roy's abilities and indicated his future hits. Roy's teenage years were framed by the foundation of Wink Westerners and the revelation of his obsession with music. He had poor eyesight and low self-esteem caused by his appearance, but talent won over. The band was welcomed on gigs and had some recognition. There was a very good moment when they were offered $400 to play a dance, and this really confirmed Roy's belief that he had a career ahead of him in music. Roy was a determined young man with aspirations of becoming a musician. He went to North Texas State College and had a fallback plan to study geology in case he failed in his music career. Roy heard the song, Ooby Dooby, which was a huge turning point for him, inspiring him to return to Wink with the song in hand and a newfound dedication to his craft. The royal scandal of the Wink Westerners to Teen Kings was a remarkable event in Roy's musical career. They put on performances that caught the eye of the music insiders, and among other events, the one that they will never forget was their encounter with Johnny Cash. He was very nice to them, and he suggested that Roy should approach Sam Phillips, the owner of Sun Records. The band members were able to record Ooby Dooby for G-Well Records, which was located in Odessa. Nevertheless, Roy's path was not entirely smooth, but Roy's self-confidence and belief in his skills raised him high. Roy's Ooby Dooby brought him success and the attention of the industry's high-profile people, including Sam Phillips. Roy's individual voice and musical style distinguished him, making him a truly upcoming star who commanded a huge following in the music industry. Early Struggle the history of his early career is unique in a series of landmark moments, each pointing toward his remarkable rise to a legendary singer. To continue with their success of Ooby Dooby, the Teen Kings left for Memphis's Sun Studio to re-record the song for Sun Records. The release of this single as Sun Single in May 1956 was a major achievement, as it entered into the Billboard Hot 100 and sold 200,000 copies. However, with this early success, tensions started brewing in the Teen Kings over some disputed writing credits and royalties, and this eventually led to the breakup of the band. Undeterred by the breakup of the band, Orbison stayed in Memphis and plunged himself into the complexity of recording with Sun Records. Although Sam Phillips was more struck with Orbison's guitar playing than his vocals, Roy's gift for songwriting was beginning to show. Songs like Go, Go, Go and Rock House exhibited Orbison's adaptability in the rockabilly style. Yet Orbison's early venture into ballads was met with resistance because the producer from Sun Records, Jack Clement, remained doubtful of Orbison's ability to be a ballad singer. Even though his early ballads did not receive good treatment, due to his tolerance and hard work, he continued to improve. Although at first Orbison did not achieve much financial success, the royalties from Claudette helped him a great deal, providing him with the possibility to make a down payment for his own Cadillac. 
Feeling restricted by the constraints imposed by Sun Records, Orbison put the recording on hold and hit the road with tours all over Texas. Nevertheless, the pull of music was still strong, which brought him to a short residency at Acuff Rose Music, a very successful songwriting firm. At Acuff Rose Music, Orbison worked with significant figures such as Chet Atkins and investigated the chance of selling his compositions to RCA Victor. Although he tried to overcome these, Orbison's shy personality and different singing techniques did not succeed in creating an immediate effect. But his 50 years of hard labor in his art never stopped. Juggling the pressures of late-night performances with family obligations, Roy Orbison would often hide out in his car and work on his songwriting. One of these solitary moments is when songwriter Joe Melson, a close friend of Orbison, waited for Roy to sign his autograph in Texas, 1958. Their unplanned meeting gave rise to a joint partnership that yielded several unforgettable tunes. In three recording sessions that took place between 1958 and 1959, Orbison visited Victor's Nashville studios and made seven songs. Apart from all his endeavors, only two singles were approved by the label for release, thus pointing out the difficulties of getting recognition as a solo artist. On the other hand, Destiny interfered when Wesley Rose noticed Orbison's talent and introduced him to Fred Foster, the distinguished producer at Monument Records. This meeting marked the beginning of a new stage in Orbison's career, since Monument Records became the right place for him to demonstrate his musical abilities to a wide public. Through the transition to a new label, Monument Records, Orbison re discovered goals and encouragement, which later would lead to his fame. The artistic vision of Orbison thrived with the help of Fred Foster. He became a leader in the music industry. Stardom the rise of Roy Orbison to stardom was a revolutionary chapter in the music industry, where his creative input into the Nashville sound put him among the musical legends. Teaming with a group called the Nashville A-Team, a bunch of esteemed session musicians that included luminaries such as Chet Atkins and Owen Bradley, Orbison developed a new sonic landscape that blended rock, pop, and country elements. Upon his first visit to the Nashville studio of Monument Records in 1958, Paperboy was recorded and finished, a song that was initially rejected by RCA Victor. Nevertheless, the next sessions produced outstanding results thanks to the skill of engineer Bill Porter and producer Fred Foster. Orbison's unique vocal style, combined with elaborate string arrangements and detailed orchestration, gave his music a very elegant sophistication that distinguished him from other artists of his time. The release of Uptown, with the ghostly vocal harmonies of Joe Melson and the Anita Kerr doo-wop backing singers, was a very important moment in Orbison's career. The high-flying melodies and emotional lyrics of his songs kindled the desire of the public, and Orbison became a popular artist. With the decline of the 1950s rock and roll era, Orbison's unique sound became the darling of the hearts of the listeners, thus turning him into a hit machine. Only the Lonely, Know the Way I Feel, was a haunting melody with Orbison's falsetto, and this song topped the charts, putting him on the map as a true star. Orbison's later cooperation with Joe Melson resulted in a few number one hits, such as Blue Angel and I'm Hurtin', where his perfect vocal range and an emotional style were demonstrated. Expanding his musical horizon to more diverse music, Orbison ventured into new lands with tunes such as Running Scared, a swooning ballad packed with influences of Maurice Ravel's Bolero. Although Orbison had first faced challenges, his dynamic voice and unique recording techniques caught the attention of the audience and earned him both critical acclaim and success in the business. A nickname, The Big O, that Orbison was given in 1962 during his visit to Australia added overtones of his vast stage persona and theatrical seriousness. The latter even includes titles like Crying, Dream Baby How Long Must I Dream, and Working for the Man. These songs also increased the success and reputation of Orbison as a great storyteller who was a true master in writing stories of love, lost and gained back with the help of his spectacular lyrics and unforgettable melodies. Orbison remained more of the child prodigy, and his genius overcame the difficulties of being a famous person and the conflicts in his personal life. His creative influence was always present in the world of music. His First Love the story about Roy Orbison's first wife, Claudette, is one of tragedy and passionate love. Not only was he a musician extraordinaire, but Orbison also had an obsession with machinery, particularly automobiles and motorcycles. Bikes were both Claudette's and Roy's shared love. They emphasized their solid bond, 
which was a mutual interest in adventure. Yet those happy adventures were cut short. On June 6, 1966, Roy climbed on the motorcycle with Claudette, ready to explore new roads and places and experience the feeling of liberty on an open road. The journey would have been unbelievably beautiful if only a truck driver had not collided with the bike that Claudette was riding, taking her life in an instant and bringing their joyful trip to an end. The cruelest irony was that it was at the age of 24 that Claudette's life was rudely and violently taken away from her, leaving behind a husband, Roy, who was to grieve the pain of loss for the rest of his life. The terrible influence of the untimely demise of his beloved Claudette went through Orbison's soul as it was written in the lyrics and melody of Too Soon to Know, which helped it to reach number three on British charts, making it understandable to the listeners that they could feel a deep sorrow and heavy heart of the singer. In a similar way to many other artists dealing with deep loss, Orbison found music to be therapeutic and poured all his mournfulness and time into his art. In his songs, he made many songs in Claudette's memory, preserving their love and the anguish of its absence with amazing precision. Although it has been more than 55 years since Claudette Orbison's demise, her legacy lives on. One thing that remains is her husband's music, classic tunes, and heartfelt words, which keep her memory evergreen and in the hearts of fans all over the world. This story is an important reminder of the fragility of our lives and the wonderful power of love. Career Decline In June 1965, Roy Orbison's career turned a major corner as his contract with Monument Records came to an end. Under the leadership of agent Wesley Rose, Orbison moved to MGM Records in a deal worth more than $1 million, intending to widen his portfolio into television and movies in imitation of the legendary Elvis Presley. A cinephile by nature, Orbison was a deep lover of films and would attend numerous screens a day when he was not busy in his own musical business. Wesley Rose's enlarged position also included him as Orbison's producer. Yet Fred Foster suggested later that this change might have an influence on the commercial downfall of Orbison's works at MGM. This sentiment was re-echoed by the engineer Bill Porter, who claimed that Orbison's best work was done in conjunction with the A-Team at RCA Victor in Nashville. Although it was full of promise, Roy Orbison's first album for MGM, There Is Only One Roy Orbison, failed to set the world alight. On his way to another tour in the UK in 1966, tragedy struck Orbison. He had a motorcycle accident at a racetrack and ended up with a fractured foot. Still, he did perform that evening, and this fact demonstrated his absolute dedication to his art. But out of all these tragedies, there was a glimmer of hope. In 1968, another tragedy hit when Orbison got the heartbreaking information of a house fire that took the lives of his two eldest sons. The loss, combined with his home being destroyed, cast Orbison into deep sorrow. However, in the darkness, a glimmer of hope appeared, for he found love and comradeship with German-born Barbara Jacobs, whom he married in 1969. Their marriage was blessed with the birth of two boys, signifying a new era of hope and renewal in Orbison's tumultuous life. Comeback. The 1970s was a difficult era for Roy Orbison, filled with failure, doubt, and an unwearying quest for success. Even though he had enjoyed victories in the past, the decade saw Orbison fighting with waning album sales, unsuccessful singles, and slow-creeping self-doubt. In 1976, ten years had passed with him not having a record that topped the charts, a failure that had something to do with the fact that the musical landscapes had changed and that the people's musical tastes had changed as well. Thus, his exit from MGM Records in 1973 was a major breakpoint, which started an era of doubt and sadness. His albums moldered in the closet of obscurity and puzzles over his own abilities, wringing his hands over the fear of life passing by just when he could have been at his best. The international releases were put on hold because of the depressing sales rate in the US, which left Orbison alone in a sea of doubt and uncertainty. However, Orbison's influence was widespread. Even in his darkest days, his legacy lived on through the very popular covers of his songs by artists of all genres and generations. From Graham Parsons to Bruce Springsteen, Orbison's songs never failed to strike a chord with audiences across the world in his lifetime, a living proof of the power of his music. The Ray of Light appeared in 1976, when a compilation of Orbison's greatest hits hit number one in the UK charts and served as a glimmer of hope in his turbulent career. An opening for the Eagles in the same year allowed Orbison to bring out his soul again, charming audiences with his old tunes. Tragedy struck again towards the end of 1977, 
When Orbison's health radically altered, he had to undergo emergency surgery to deal with badly obstructed coronary arteries. Orbison was operated upon, and on coming round, despite the physical pain of his ordeal, he felt much better, his spirit undaunted by the challenges. The 1980s dawned with a new hope for Orbison, as Don McLean's version of Crying became a hit and brought new life to his music and a revival of his popularity. Orbison's role in the Dukes of Hazard and surprise appreciation in unexpected locations like Bulgaria served to enhance his status as a music icon with sustained attraction. Significantly, collaborations with Emmylou Harris and accolades like the Grammy Award for Best Country Collaboration once again tempted Orbison's career and provided glimpses of the revival that was on its way. Orbiton's In Dreams in Blue Velvet by David Lynch exposed him to a new audience and showed how his haunting tunes were eternal. In 1987, Orbison's star was on the rise once more as he was elected into the Nashville Songwriters Hall of Fame and received a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction from none other than Bruce Springsteen. A star-studded concert, where such luminaries as Jackson Brown and K.D. Lang performed, was a triumphal celebration of Orbison's immortal heritage, returning him to the upper echelons of the music industry. The resurgence of Orbison in the music industry reached its zenith with the formation of the Traveling Wilburys, a legendary supergroup that included luminaries such as George Harrison and Bob Dylan, along with Orbison. This collaboration marked a pivotal moment in Orbison's career, confirming his status as an enduring musical icon. Their inaugural album received widespread acclaim from both fans and critics, serving as a testament to Orbison's enduring talent and cementing his place in music history. Orbison's schedule was packed with activity during the final months of his life as he fully embraced his newfound success with renewed vigor. He remained committed to his craft despite health concerns, refusing to squander the opportunity that fame had granted him for a second time. Through long recording sessions and interviews, Orbison remained determined in his commitment to his artistry. By November 1988, Orbison was fully immersed in the finality of his solo album, Mystery Girl, a project that epitomized his boundless creativity and resilience. Although his health deteriorated, Orbison persevered, driven by an unrelenting passion for his craft and an unwavering belief in the transcendent power of music to transcend all obstacles. Orbison left behind a lasting legacy that continues to inspire generations of musicians and fans alike through his unwavering dedication and musical prowess. Demise. The last days of Roy Orbison were a swerving blur of events, a bittersweet termination of his victorious return to the limelight. Following a successful show at the Front Row Theater in Highland Heights, Ohio on December 4, 1988, Orbison went back to Hendersonville for some long-awaited rest before a new undertaking. His fatigue notwithstanding, he still made much effort into his art and flew to London to shoot two more videos for the traveling Wilburys. On December 6, 1988, Orbison, with his bus driver and best friend, Benny Birchfield, spent the day doing what they both loved in peace. As the night settled, Orbison went to Birchfield's residence in Hendersonville for dinner, where they had a pleasant evening together in a relaxed environment. However, they did not realize it would be their last night together. Tragedy hit all of a sudden, and in the most unsuspected manner after Orbison collapsed, after excusing himself to the loo. Desperately taken to the hospital in an attempt to save his life by his loving wife, but Orbison passed away due to a heart attack at the age of 52. After his death, thousands of tributes started to pour in from all over the world, proof of the huge influence Orbison had on the music industry and the hearts of millions of fans. In Nashville and Los Angeles, memorials were held where friends, family and fellow musicians came to remember and pay homage to the life of a real musical trailblazer. He was buried in an unmarked grave at Westwood Village Memorial Park Cemetery, and that is his final resting place. Even though he was taken from this world too soon, the spirit of Roy Orbison lives on among the eternal melodies and haunting words that are still telling in the hearts of people all over the world. Aftermath the decision to let Mysterious Girl go into the stores of Virgin Records on January 31, 1988, stood as one of the most important culminations in Roy Orbison's prolific lifespan. This album, which was a posthumous masterpiece, captured the real spirit of Orbison. Though it was released after his demise, it has helped his famous songs to touch the listeners of this generation. Among its hit single tracks, especially You Got It, co-written with Jeff Lynne and Tom Petty. This became a super hit going up to number nine in the United States of America, 
and a superb one in the United Kingdom. The song's success won him a posthumous Grammy Award nomination, where he enjoys his longevity and relevance in the music industry. This review by Rolling Stone Spot On calls Mystery Girl a worthy swan song for Orbison, breaking new grounds but retaining the greatness and scope of his classic sound. It was no wonder that the album became a hallmark of Orbison's musical iconoclasm, with it still being admired by listeners around the globe to this day. The Traveling Wilbury's debut album, Volume 1, also saw great success, staying for an incredible 53 weeks in the US charts and reaching the peak of number three. The album reached number one in Australia and reached first place in the United Kingdom. The album called Sigh No More then won the Grammy for Best Rock Performance by a Duo or Group. Rolling Stone designated it as a classic by adding it to the 100 best albums of the decade, and that has further made it a piece of timeless music. Perhaps the best demonstration of the far-reaching effect of Orbison's talent was the success of his posthumous releases. When he topped the US Top 5 charts in April 1989, he became the first deceased artist who had back-to-back -back albums in the US Top 5 after Elvis. Traveling Wilbury's Volume 1 made it to third place, Mystery Girl was next at fourth place, and Orbison reached even higher peaks. There were two of his solo albums in the top three on February 11, 1989, which further testifies to the longevity of his music. The Traveling Wilbury's music videos, too, had an equivalent paying homage to Orbison's lasting legacy. For Handle With Care, the video had Orbison, but the end of the line video was actually released after he passed away, and it featured Orbison's guitar in a rocking chair next to a picture of him as he sang his solo part. These images worked like an emotional push, unveiling the chameleonic nature of one of the members of the band and serving as a reminder of Orbison's significant impact on the band. After that, the music of Orbison continued to delight the public all over the globe, King of Hearts is another album with Orbison's legendary songs, which was re-released on October 20th, 1992, emphatically placing him as a musical legend. Legacy. 1950s rock and roll took a different path in that of Roy Orbison's musical career. The time, however, was defined by the strong beat and the rebellious themes, but Orbison's records were something different due to the unusual rhythm, profound lyrics, and unrivaled quality of the voice and style of his performance. In contrast to most artists of his time, Orbisian's music went beyond the typical rock and roll conventions and earned him a reputation as a musician who was of a similar caliber to a classically trained one for its complexity and depth of emotion. Orbison's special skill of writing haunting melodies and contemplative lyrics created a feeling of nostalgia and pensive nature that reached listeners emotionally. His voice, range, and pitch were unparalleled, which gave him nicknames like the Caruso of Rock and the Big O. He may not ever have cited classical music as a direct influence, though. Instead of following, he had his own way, and with that, he mixed various elements of musical styles from his teenage years to produce completely new stuff. In November 2018, Roy's Boys LLC, which was a Nashville-based company founded by Orbison's sons, said that they would release an important work of their father, Unchained Melodies, Roy Orbison, with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. This album featured Orbison's evergreen classics reimagined with orchestral arrangements. This album offered a new idea for his iconic music. The release of these initiatives was more than just a tribute to Orbison's legacy. It also demonstrated the ongoing power of his music. Despite the passage of time, Orbison's songs continue to enchant audiences, crossing decades and leaving an unforgettable effect on the history of popular music. His legacy lives on through inventive collaborations and groundbreaking technologies, ensuring that his music is remembered for years to come. His son reveals the reason behind his sunglasses. Roy Jr. Wesley and Alex Orbison, known as Roy's Boys, released The Authorized Roy Orbison. This extraordinary biography not only recounted the legendary musician's life, but was also an effort to revive his memories. One of the most fascinating findings within the pages of this definitive biography is the creation myth of Orbison's famous sunglasses. On the UK tour of 1963, which was going to be a milestone in Orbison's career, he was joined by the Beatles, but destiny interfered with his regular glasses, which were left in a plane by mistake. Having no other choice, he put on a dark pair of sunglasses that he was carrying with him. This simple gesture then became viral. According to Roy Jr. in his recount to Rolling Stone, he said, Dad couldn't see without glasses. He stepped off the plane in England, and people were taking pictures, and that's what they saw. Dad with the dark glasses. Consequently, 
The legend of the Big O with his beloved trademark shades was born out of necessity, and it eventually polished into a symbol of Orbison's mystique and dramatic persona. Far from stories of style and star, the authorized Roy Orbison goes into the details of Orbison's life, from his simple startup in Texas to his incredible breakthrough on the international stage. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.